Networking in the computer world is a huge topic. You can actually base your entire career over networking and still probably never learn it all. But if you're just trying to brush up on your networking skills to help you build your DevOps skills, there's only about 20% of the networking tools and resources that I use 80% of the time. So in this video, I'm gonna show you what they are so you know where to focus your study efforts. Hey, what's up? I'm Will from DevOps for Developers. And so the first thing I wanna talk about in networking is the OSI model. There's this OSI model that's seven layers and it's really important for you to understand that. It starts all the way down at the bottom with the physical layer, which is your actual network cabling and goes all the way up to the application layer. And so it's important for you to understand what each of the layers are, what they're for, why they're used and like the main takeaway from there is understanding the different things that you interact with you know what layer are they operating at like the ip addressing happens on layer three the tcp protocol happens on layer four the application layer protocol happens on layer seven and then when you're troubleshooting or designing a network knowing that those different layers exist help you understand how to architect or troubleshoot the entire network. Another skill you're gonna frequently use is IP addressing and subnet masks. So IP addresses are the addresses for the computers on networks throughout the internet. And the subnet mask tells you who's in your neighborhood and who you've gotta go long distance to see. For example, if you've got a web server that the IP address is 172.16.0.30 and it's trying to talk to a database server whose IP address is 10.0.0.10. Well, you know, first of all, that those are two completely different networks. So your web application server is gonna to have to leave its network in order to go talk to the database server. Also, one of the other things you should recognize instantly about that is those are both RFC 1918 addresses. So knowing that it's RFC 1918 is not important, but knowing that those are both non-routable address spaces is. And what that means is when you see those IP addresses, you know that you're operating within a private network. And so to talk to anything else, you're gonna to have to have a gateway router and some network address translation and different things like that. So it's important to keep in your mind when you're designing or troubleshooting these things to know that those types of address spaces exist. When it comes to Linux, there's some different networking skills that you're gonna use commonly. The same probably holds true for Windows, but I do very little Windows network, so I'm not the person to talk to on that. But for Linux, the first thing is how to find your IP address. And then you're also gonna know what your gateway is and then a common thing that I do is find out who I'm using for DNS. DNS being the domain name resolution service. So whenever you type in something like google.com, it translates that to an IP address, which going back to the first section allows you to figure out how to navigate to that particular IP address from your IP address. Some of the common Troubleshooting tools I'll use are like Traceroute, uh, Ping, and Nmap, so it's good to know those. And then also how to configure a firewall on a Linux system. So you always wanna have firewalls on your systems, and then part of your security practice should be just opening up the ports that are needed on that server. So if it's a web server, you're only gonna open up the web ports operating on the TCP layer, or if it's um, you know a Postgres database server, only opening up port 5432 for those database services, possibly port 22 to allow SSH access, different things like that comes up all the time. And then once you do that, it's also handy to know how to tell which ports are open especially if you configured the firewall, but you're not sure that it's working. You need to know how to list the open ports and see what's listening to that port. Also, when you're troubleshooting, it's a really good idea to go and verify that the ports you're expecting to be open are. So that's a really common 
trick to have as well. The final one that I'll bring up on Linux is Telnet, and I actually use this one all the time. So I'll give you a specific example here. Telnet allows you to connect to any IP address on any port. And the reason it comes in handy is if you're troubleshooting a web server, then you know you, your browser might be trying to connect to port 80, but there can be a whole bunch of different things that are happening within that layer that are preventing that from working. And so Telnet's a little command line utility. You can type Telnet, the IP address that you want, and port 80, and it will instantly connect you if it can. And so what that does is it allows you to know that there's not a networking issue and that port 80 is in fact open on that server and you can connect to it. So if you are having problems with that, it's not a networking issue, which is always a good thing to do in troubleshooting is to rule out things that aren't causing the problem and eventually you'll be left with the thing that is causing the problem. The last part of networking I'm gonna talk about has to do with cloud providers. I'm gonna specifically talk about AWS because that's the one that I use pretty much a majority of the time. One of the big things to understand in AWS is the VPC or virtual private cloud. So that's a basically a private network just for you inside of AWS. And you really want to run all of your services inside of your VPC and then only open up services that are necessary for your business to the outside world. But in order to wrap your head around that, you got to understand what a VPC is, period, right? Along with the VPCs, uh, security groups is another place I spend a lot of time in AWS networking. And you use security groups to open up those different connections. So if you have a web server, you can use a security group to open up port 80 and 443 to that load balancer. Or if you have a database server, you know, you can use different VPCs or different subnets within your VPC. And between the subnets, you only want to open up the right ports. And so you'll use a security group to do that. I mentioned load balancers. Those are super important for AWS in order to provide highly available, scalable services. So instead of allowing your customers or your clients to connect directly to the web server, you send them to a load balancer. And that gives you the ability to terminate SSL certificates there. So you're not trying to install SSL certs on all of your different web servers and also provide load balancing. So the load balancer will check the health of your web servers. Whenever one of those fails the health check, the load balancer will stop routing traffic to it, which prevents your customers from hitting a dead end on your website. Now, inside the VPC, I told you that it's all inter your own internal network, right? But Odds are you don't live at AWS or inside of their network. So from wherever you are, you're going to have to be able to get to your servers and your instances in there. And so one of the ways it's common to do that is with either a VPN or a bastion host. So it's really important to understand how to build, configure, and maintain both of those. And then that also ties into security groups so that you can restrict access to only the resources that are necessary inside there. And then you can do that by groups as well so that your, uh, you know, your system administration team has full access to everything, but maybe your developers have access to dev and staging, but not to production or whatever makes sense for your business. And then the last thing I touched on it already is SSL. That's a pretty common networking component. I think it falls into networking. It's kind of a, a gray area, I guess. But uh, one of the things that you do is you always want to launch and deploy your websites on SSL. And so knowing how to configure and get SSL certificates and knowing the different rules about SSL certificates for wildcard certificates, or single domain name certificates, and where to install them is really good information to have because, well, because your SSL is not going to work if you don't understand it. So I guess that was really a dumb statement, but there we go. So I thought about this a lot. Those are the things I do in networking on a regular basis. And I think if you go and learn about those and study those, you'll have a decent enough understanding of networking to continue on building your skill set. And then, of course, all kinds of things are going to come up 
um, outside of that, but you'll have this foundational knowledge and then you can just start to build on that knowledge as the experience or as the situation dictates that additional knowledge is required. If you like this video, be sure and check out the other 2080 videos I've done, like the one on 2080 for Docker, the 20% of Docker that you'll use 80% of the time, and I'll see you over in that video.